June 26, 2019, we at Auction House Künke will hold our auction 323. It will begin with an extensive special collection of French coins and medals. Using the pieces featured in this collection, we've put together a brief summary of everything you need to know about French coinage. This first part will take you from antiquity to the end of the Middle Ages. Gallia est omnis divisa in partes tres. This is how Gaius Julius Caesar begins his account of the Gallic War, which is our most important source relating to the history of the Celtic tribes that lived on French soil more than 2000 years ago. These tribes struck coins, meaning that even in antiquity, French monetary history had already begun. Remember the Allobroges? They supposedly asked Caesar for help because of the Helvetians planning to emigrate and therefore sparked the Gallic War in the first place. At least uh, that's what Caesar claimed. This small obole which depicts a stylized hat on its obverse and a wheel on its reverse was money of the Elabroges and was struck immediately after the Gallic War. In around 250 BC, the Parisii settled on the island of Paris, and of course, they began to strike their own coins. Their gold staters, which seem almost abstract, are some of the most beautiful coins struck by Celtic tribes. We can see a stylized face on the obverse and a galloping horse on the reverse. After the Celts came the Romans. They too struck coins in France and in large quantities. Augustus made Lugdunum, modern Lyon, one of the empire's most important mints. And that was part of policy. You see, Augustus officially gave some of his power back to the Senate. Of course, he kept enough means of power for himself to ensure he could retain control. The coinage is a good example of how he achieved this. Augustus made a big show of officially transferring control of the mint in Rome to the Senate. But the mint in Rome produced a fraction of the coins required to pay the legions. These were made under his control in mints located in the provinces, so predominantly in Lugdunum. But whether or not this epoch of coinage is actually part of France's monetary history is a matter for debate. The collector, whose pieces will be sold in auction 323, decided not to include any Roman coins in his collection. When Clovis I unified the Frankish tribes, received baptism and founded the Merovingian dynasty, he followed ancient tradition and adopted the idea of royal coinage. But as his successors began to lose their influence, this privilege was appropriated by others. Numismatists know of around 2,000 people that made tremises in more than 800 locations. These people are referred to as monetarii, though nobody knows exactly what legal status they held. For instance, this piece was made by a man called Medulfus a name that appears repeatedly on Tremises from many other cities, including Nancy, Amiens and Nantes. The origin of our piece is stated on its obverse. We can see that it is from Ferruciacum, which still exists today as Saint-Étienne de Fursac. When the Arabs conquered North Africa, the Christian rulers lost their access to the Sudanese gold mines. Less and less gold was available in Europe, and that impacted its coinage. Tremises were struck from gold of deteriorating quality, until they were replaced by a pure silver currency. This new currency's name derives from the most important silver coin of antiquity, the denarius. A 
And so the time came for a monetary reform, which is often wrongly attributed to Charlemagne. It was actually his father, Pippin, who issued an edict stipulating the weight and fineness of the new denarii. Charlemagne modified his father's monetary system and declared the Novos Denarius to be the mandatory coin across his empire. All of these denarii bear the king's name on the obverse and the place of minting on the reverse. Charlemagne and his successor profited from the rich veins of silver discovered close to the city of Mel, which were systematically exploited under the Carolingians. In 987, Hugo Capet was elected as King of France. At that time, he was just one of many powerful noblemen. And so, under Hugo Capet, French coinage split into two branches. These were the Monnaie Royale, royal coins, and the Monnaie Feudale, coins issued by those lords who were connected with the French king by feudal law. This is a royal coin, a denier struck by order of the French king, Philip II Augustus. And this coin comes from his famous English counterpart, King Richard the Lionheart. Having said this, this denier is not an English coin. Richard issued it as Count of Poitou. As the Count of Poitou, even the English king was a vassal of the French ruler. That makes the little denier a perfect example of the Monet Feodal group. Louis IX is known for his two failed crusades against Tunis and is epithet saint. Numismatists, however, consider him a realistic and forward looking economic policymaker. After all, he issued a decree in 1262 ruling that royal coins were to be accepted across France. And in the Gros Tournois, he created a coin that was bound to spread throughout Europe. This was facilitated by the Champagne Fairs, where money changers from all over Europe were to settle their financial transactions and learn about the latest ideas which they would then take home with them. In this way, the Gros Tournois influenced the Tournoises of the Rhineland as well as the Prague Groschen. In 1285, a man came to power who went down in history as the royal counterfeiter, Philip IV, called Philip the Fair. Here he is on this gold coin, a florin d'or à la reine. This coin, which was probably intended as a gift, may look splendid, but the common people suffered from the monetary mass ordered by the king. The thereby well-hidden debasement of the coinage was financing his dream of omnipotence. Evidence of Philip IV's chronic lack of money even made it into popular culture. In 1312, Philip IV had the Knights Templar order disbanded to take over its assets. Even among his contemporaries, this was considered a crime. The fact that the male line of his family died out within a very short time was regarded as God's punishment for his transgression. With his nephew Philip VI, the House of Valois came to power. Here we see the new king depicted on a splendid gold coin, a pavillon d'or, named after the canopy housing the king's throne. Philip's claim to the throne didn't go uncontested. The English king, Edward III, was actually a direct grandchild of Philip IV, but through the female line. He believed his claim to the throne to be more legitimate than Philip VI. This sparked a long war, which went down in history as the Hundred Years' War. In terms of monetary history, this war had two primary consequences. Firstly, it produced a host of splendid gold denominations. 
These are among the most beautiful coins of the Middle Ages, and, in terms of weight and fineness, they are faultless. And they had to be, because the French kings used them to secure the support of all those parties they relied upon in their fight against the English king. This may have been the actual purpose of this coin, which, when it was struck in early 1340, was the heaviest gold denomination ever struck in French monetary history. Its obverse depicts the French royal crown, affirming Philip VI claim to be the only legitimately crowned ruler of France. This very common type of coin is known by numismatists as a franc à cheval. This coin brought the term franc into numismatics for the first time, although the coin type was not continued. The reason for its production was the unfortunate Battle of Poitiers, in which the French king John the Good was taken prisoner by the English. In order to pay the ransom of three million écus d'or, huge quantities of this coin type were struck. This was all financed with the silver coins, which were rapidly and fraudulently decreasing in quality. Here we see a Gros Tournois from 1359. From the Gros Etoile that were struck at the same time, we know that eight emissions were issued in six months, over which time the weight was gradually decreased by more than half and the silver content reduced by a third. After all, somebody had to pay John the Good's ransom. And that somebody was the little guy, ordinary people. This is why the silver coinage kept constantly deteriorating, which was the second consequence of the Hundred Years' War. In 1429, Joan of Arc crowned Charles VII as King of France, bringing about a turning point in the Hundred Years' War. By 1436, conditions had stabilized to such an extent that the authorities were able to consider a monetary reform. Evidence to this reform includes this écu d'or à la couronne, which allegedly became the standard gold coin in France. The silver coins were also standardized once again. The gros de droit, exemplified here, was made of an alloy with an impressive silver content of over 90% and was therefore considered a stable coin and trusted by merchants across Europe. The Hundred Years' War ended in 1453 with the Battle of Castillon. Some historians like to consider this year the end of the Middle Ages and the beginning of the modern period. It's also a good time for us to take a break. We'll take you through the monetary history of the modern period in a second film. We at the Künker Auction House are delighted to invite you to our Summer Auctions 2019. Please, don't hesitate to contact us if you have any questions.